thank you very much for the kind introduction and I welcome you all. Thank you for listening to me. Um, I want to talk today about test infrastructure and the possibility of putting, using cloud resources for test infrastructure. Um, as you may see, I'm alone here on stage. Um, not here with me is Martin, who is currently expecting the birth of his third child. And uh, also uh, Martin and Patrick uh, Habak, who is also here, um, did a lot of the work in prototyping what I'm going to present today. So thank you for that. So we're in the tools and methods track here at the Big Tech Day. And for this reason, even though the title of the talk is quite nebulous, I want to present you very concrete tools to give to you um, and methods that you can, may want to use for making your test infrastructure faster. Um, I am going to go just tell you what I'm going to present, then I'm going to present it to you, and then I'm going to tell you again what I have told you so that you all remember it. So first, I want to talk about the tool called Jenkins, which some of you may know. <laughs> Who knows Jenkins? Okay, almost everyone. So um, the Jenkins is a continuous integration server. It's a general purpose automation server, which is very popular, at least at TNG. The method associated, most commonly associated with this is the continuous integration, which is, um, I think, a very powerful tool when you do software development. And in the previous talk, we have al also heard like, these agile methods, which are, can be very, uh, good for a company's success. Um, the th second tool I want to present is Docker. It's um, the most uh, popular tool for doing containerization. And the method I want to present, which may be useful for some of you with the, the specific setups, is to containerize continuous integration setups. And the third tool, I will talk what this means later in case it's unclear. Um, and the last tool is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a cloud toolkit for operating systems um, on container clusters or operating container clusters. And the method I want to show is combines essentially all three tools into one thing, which I just call cloudy CI pipeline for lack of a better name. And because it's also not really a product, it's a prototype which we developed um, during the tech days. So at the end of the talk, I want to have answered these questions. Essentially, why should I use continuous integration containers or cloud byte pipeline at all? When do they help me and when don't I need them? The second question I want to answer is what can these specific tools do for me rather than the methods? And I want to go a bit into the technical details, how the combined system works, and really how easy it is to set up. In case you're already an expert in this, and I realize that we probably have some people who are very proficient in all of this, and some who um, have probably not heard of many of them, there is already a playbook at github.com slash cloudy minus CI. This organization has just two repositories, and one of them is the playbook, one of them is the example project. So um, in case you're interested, you can check this out and follow it. Right. My outline, first, as I said, I will start with CI and Jenkins. I will put the tests from a single server into the containers. I will um, present Kubernetes as a tool for cloud operations, and then I will wrap up. First, the testing with continuous integration. So what we have here is we have a single machine or a set of other machines which are physically in front of you and we install Java and we install Jenkins and we configure the Jenkins so that it pulls from our GitHub repository or from our other Git repository and then we want to do continuous integration. So what is continuous integration? So continuous integration means that you set up things, set up the development in a way that you have a comprehensive feedback loop for every change that lands on the main branch of development. So every time you make a developer from your team makes a change, pushes the change to master or another branch, depending on your setup, 
um, you run every test, all the integration tests, all the unit tests, and give the developer a comprehensive feedback about their change and make sure nothing breaks so that the build is good. Why do we do this? Why should the developer not like, develop a feature and after two, two weeks come back and say, this is now finished and push it somewhere? So the reason for this is if you have more than one developer on a project, merging work gets harder and harder if you work on the same things. So um, you want to minimize the time that there are differences in the different developers' code bases. So you can also, the this makes communication more easy, you can more easier work on similar things in the code. And refactoring also gets uh, much easier. Ideally, you would want the st state on your master branch or your git checkout um, to be workable at all times. And for this, continuous integration, I think, is essential. If you already have this very desirable state that everything works at any time and is checked by tests, then you can transition to another method, which I will not go into here, which is continuous deployment. This just means that every time you have um, a green build, you also deploy to either a test system or if you have trust and faith in your process, you deploy to production. The go-to tool for T at TNG for testing, for continuous integration testing is Jenkins, as I mentioned. Why is this so? Why should you, why should you use testing Jenkins? So if you have this Jenkins already set up, um, it has a very large feature set, which is very accessible because it has one of these uh, fancy graphical user interfaces. It's not looking great, but it has gr uh, a lot of functionality behind it. And you can usually find what you're looking for. It has a large community, as in the previous talk, maybe check, uh, as you um, have heard about CheckMK. Jenkins has also a large amount of plugins, uh, over 1,000 plugins, which can do anything you ever dream. And if this is enough, enough, not enough, you can also extend Jenkins with groovy scripts. So, for example, if you would like, if in case one of the developers on your team caused, pushed a change that uh, broke the build, you could control your little uh, mobile rocket launcher to launch a rocket at them and tell them that they messed up. Um, not that I would do such a thing. Um, it is very configurable, so you can do continuous integration, continuous deployment, and also general operations automation. So you have these nice buttons that you can push, which then make a backup or give you a backup file from, or a snapshot from the current production system. And because there are buttons and you have reviewed the code that is behind the buttons, this makes for a very um, safe uh, feeling um, so that everybody in the team can actually do operations as well, right? So obviously there are alternatives which can be more or less useful. In case you're on GitHub, you may have heard of Travis, which is very easy to set up and free for, um, for open source projects. So you just, um, it integrates very well with GitHub and um, is very lightweight solution in contrast to Jenkins, which has its values. Um, you also have heard of GitLab CI, which is also either a hosted or a self-hosted solution. Um, they're all valid alternatives, however, we don't have that much experience with them. Um, so I'm just going to mention them here for completeness. Now, let's come to the real problem of this talk, which is that exhaustive tests can be slow. Really slow. Um, they're not only slow because they use a lot of, they do a lot of CPU intensive calculations, they can also be slow because of latency, because um, not all projects may be able to dispense with a database. Some pro projects have to talk to a database, which may be slow. The connection may be slow, the setup and teardown times may be slow. And you may have single threaded parts which just won't go any faster on a single machine. So we have tests that may run for hours, if not days, if they're on a single machine. So um, this is bad. This is bad for many reasons. One way why this is bad is that the feedback loop from your developer, the change your developer pushed, to the fact that it's actually broken, 
is very long. So if some other developer, um, during that time when the tests run, but everything seems fine for now, but already something has failed, pushes another change and starts another pipeline of tests, um, at the end of that pipeline, they will get a broken build because, without any fault of their own because they interleaved the tests with, uh, interleaved the change with the change of the other guy. So then you have a broken build and you cannot do anything about it except maybe uh, do, uh, command your rocket launcher to um, fire a rocket at the other programmer or prod them. Um, so you, and then you don't actually really care because you didn't break it. So why should you fix it? So um, this leads in a team to a spiral of successive text test failures, which may last a day or two days or a whole sprint where the Jenkins never actually manages to produce a build which is passing all the tests. And I don't think I need to say any more because this is obviously bad. So one solution is to just uh, beat the problem with hardware until it goes away. Um, and un unfortunately, <laughs> or maybe fortunately, or maybe sensibly, the bud budget for hardware acquisitions which don't have any obvious benefits like running your production system is quite limited in many cases. Um, especially if you're just using it for with work hours and uh, it sits idle eating, eating power all, all, all the other times. Um, the other way, other reason is why, if you are uh, limited by latency, why don't you put more threads and more instances of your tests on the same machine as also resource contention? You then have to invest quite a lot of things into config things like configurable installation paths, which we have heard in the previous talk is a really bad idea, and um, also uh, things like port number allocation for databases which have multiple instances and Stuff like this, which is quite a lot of work, even though it doesn't sound like it, except if your app is really tiny and really, uh, really uh, doesn't have this problem, but then you probably won't be in this talk, right? Uh, so one of the, the solutions you can do, um, if you don't have that much hardware, but you have a set of hardware on premises, is to test in containers. This is the second part of the talk. Containers um, are, is, a level, is a way of operating system level virtualization. Um, it has become very popular and popularized by the little whale with the containers on top, which is the logo of Docker. Um, Docker, um, so let's first, uh, maybe to make a common baseline, uh, to, I want to tell you again what containerization is and what it isn't. Containerization is operating system level virtualization, so you share the same kernel across all containers. This has some advantage, uh, this needs support from the kernel, so the kernel needs to have namespaces which isolates processes and file systems, um, and it needs to limit the resources consumed by processes in a container, otherwise one container going rogue could kill all the others. Um, you also need to connect these containers via virtual networking, and um, because Linux containers essentially were, um, um, come from a management perspective, so you want to manage your processes, they're not primarily thought of as a security mechanism. This is a, um, different in other operating systems like BSD, um, but I think it's a thing that I want to mention because you shouldn't use containers as a security mechanism. You should use it as a management mechanism. You should still trust all the programs you run in a container, right? The most widespread is uh, the Docker Container Management Engine. Um, it implements, uh, the main feature it gives you is that it has um, the images of the systems that run inside the containers are maintained as layers of file systems. And these file system layers are constructed programmatically and rep reproducibly by a Docker file. So you write commands, you essentially say where, what do I want to use as a base image, what programs do I want to install using the package manager already in the base system, and what shell commands do I want to execute, and then 
after this is executed, you have a baked image, which you can then use as a basis for containers. This is very useful. These images uh, also exist in a repository. So there is a large public repository Docker Hub for popular software where you can pull stuff from that other people published. Docker also wires up these containers with IP tables and virtual bridges so that they can talk to each other if you tell it to do so. Um, for, uh, for some time now, it can also take a specification how containers should be started and run together to form a single system because this is the way that uh, the development has gone to essentially to take containers not anymore as lightweight virtual machines, but really to take containers as process isolation, as an advanced kind of process isolation. Uh, unfortunately, Docker also has had quite a history of bugs and security issues, um, which make many people pretty um, reluctant, so to say, to use Docker actually in production systems. Um, one reason why there are alternative container management engines, which are also can also be used. Here I'm using Docker because it's the most popular and the most widespread. Um, in case, and we are actually not using it in production. We're just using it for CI, so this should be fun. <laughs> the next method I want to present is containerized tasks, uh, containerized tests. Why should we containerize our tests? Um, I have mentioned it a bit before, so we have our system under tests, containing maybe the test framework itself and the tests which should be run. And we want to run this multiple times. Maybe we want to tell one part to just run tests A to A to M, and the next part we want to tell to run another test N to Z. So we can run it in parallel and shorten the time it needs to uh, do the feedback loop. So containers are an easy way to avoid resource conflicts for file system paths and port numbers. So this is a, a good way to do that. And um, so if you do this, you should really prefer to, um, you look at your setup time and then you add some time for the tests and you try to parallelize your pipeline as much as possible so that you can get the benefit of the first method continuous integration with very short feedback loops. Um, another advantage is that you actually have a clean slate at the beginning of a run because when you start a container from a defined Docker file, then you all, always will be in the same state at the beginning of the test run. If you just use Jenkins, there is a workspace that might be cleaned up or not, and, um, and the secondary services are running on the machine itself, and may also be in a state where you don't know, um, which you don't know about. The next thing I want to present now is Kubernetes, operations in the cloud. Taking a step back, why are we actually um, thinking about this. I mean, we have now this machine set of machines where we run our continuous integration system on. It's physically in our office. We can go to it and fix it if it's broken. Um, we can push our software there. We can run the tests. Everything is fine. Um, unfortunately, some of us have to work in projects where even if you containerize your tests, if you put them on several powerful hardware machines, they still run slowly. They still run for quite some time, and uh, there is no budget left because you already have three pretty cool machines. And um, it's, uh, it's a situation where you really want to do something else, but you have a very high barrier to doing something else because Obviously, there are also some advantages to having the things really in front of you. As you can, uh, it's a very visceral relationship to your build server. It gets very loud when you're pushing something, and it's uh, very hot in the room. And well, there may be also some disadvantages to that, but uh, especially in the current weather. So we are maybe thinking about using, uh, you've heard about that there are very cheap servers out there to rent for by the hour or even by the minute and you want to use some of them. 
Unfortunately, they're very far away in terms of ping. So if you just rent some of them and attach them to your Jenkins, things are going to get slower, not faster. So maybe you can do uh, something more clever and put everything out there. But then this is also a lot of work. And if you're not going to get the budget for buying more hardware, maybe you're also not getting the budget for transferring all your stuff to the cloud. So I'm trying to get to show you how this is going to be very easy, as easy as possible. One key component to this being easy, easy is Kubernetes, because Kubernetes is a tool for cloud operations, which does a lot of things that you would have to do by hand if it wasn't there. So this is why I'm showing the image of a ship, so which can uh, which can help you navigate the, the waters instead of swimming. Swimming wouldn't be a good idea. Um, Kubernetes has been mentioned. Uh, Kubernetes has been said to be a cloud operating system. What it it is a set of tools to manage a container cluster and other associated resources which you can request from your cloud provider. Um, actually, it's itself a bit of a cloud in the cloud because once you have a set up Kubernetes cluster on some provider where you rent servers or virtual machines or what have you, then you can go to your teams and tell them, hey, we have now this Kubernetes cluster. Here, is, here are the credentials. And then they can use the self-service interface to run services and um, virtual uh, uh, containers themselves without actually having to fill out a form to request a Jenkins machine or something. So this is a very powerful concept. You, um, this is actually, I believe, the key concept of cloud computing. It's not, there is a popular saying that there is no cloud, there are only other people's computers. However, this is obviously true, like trivially so. However, the key concept behind cloud computing as it is practiced today is not that you have computing resources at your disposal. That was, that you already had before that. The key concept is that you can request them using an API without human involvement, mostly without human involvement. And that you can, um, and this makes many things possible that were not possible before. And this essentially taken to the next level means that you set up your Kubernetes cluster and then you provide this level of service, this level of automation to your teams as well. And I think this is a core concept which is very important in this space. Well, what does Kubernetes do? We stopped before I went into an aside about cloud computing. So Kubernetes manages, manages containers, um, and it, given, it manages them at the very high level. So given a deployment definition, so you define what your software is actually, you give it a container image and uh, instructions what to do, and then Kubernetes makes sure that it's actually running, it checks the health, it reschedules the containers when they fail or get unhealthy or the node dies and all the other stuff that can happen to your computers. Um, it is essentially an engine that always tries to achieve the state it has been given, the desired state of the application. Why is it, so the second question is, why is it so popular? Um, so the one thing is that it is a single binary or um, and there are very tiny distributions of Kubernetes that you can run on your laptop, which obviously doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's a good way to develop stuff for Kubernetes. Um, the other reason, obviously, that it's been developed by Google and everything developed by Google and open source is insanely popular in seconds uh, because they're obviously doing something right. Well, if you think about it, the reason why this is a good thing is that there's been a lot of experience of running large-scale container systems at Google using a very system very similar uh, than Kubernetes. And there is a lot of experience from that uh, in the design and execution of Kubernetes. So 
if you use it, you can more or less trust that it also scales well into the ranges you will very probably never ever reach. And the third, third point is also, um, given that some people are skeptical of Docker, you can replace Docker with the other container engine, Rocket. Um, you can replace your virtual networking layer depending on where you run on. You can replace uh, the integrations with the cloud providers. And it's, in general, very pluggable and extensible. So this is another advantage that's um, made it very popular. Now I want to get a bit more in the technical details. What, how does Kubernetes actually run? So you have these boxes are machines, physical or virtual. You can also do Kubernetes on your own hardware, in your own data center if you have one. Um, you set up a server, which consists of an API server. Obviously, it's self-service, so the developers have to talk to it somehow. And uh, the configuration state is um, managed by etcd. It's kept by etcd, which is a um, cluster database, which, is, uh, which keeps the data consistent over stuff like network partitions and node failures and stuff. Um, then it contains a controller and a scheduler, which controls where the containers go that uh, are stated to exist by the configuration. The actual work is done by the Kubernetes nodes, where there is a kubelet, little server written in Go, so easy to deploy. And um, the networking is handled by a kube proxy, which um, spans up using the plugin network a virtual IP space, which doesn't actually represent, which isn't actually uh, talked. Uh, it's kind of a, like an overlay network where the IP addresses are purely virtual and only exist from the point of view of those nodes. So you didn't have to talk to your AWS to uh, get these IP ranges. They're always the same. They're always configurable uh, to be the same uh, in this network. Um, and there are no conflicts. That's important. So and on, this, um, on this node, we have a thing called a pod. A pod is not a container. It's a container of containers. So we reached the next level. <laughs> um, because containers have evolved into providing a single service or a single application, now we need to combine applications into something that can actually work together. So we start a pod with several containers, for example, a database, an application server. And being in a single pod, is like being on the same machine, so they can talk to each other using localhost. And they, um, being a pod, as an administrative unit means that they live and die together. That means a pod is either running or it's not running. And it must, um, a pod is essentially the entity that it doesn't make sense uh, that to run the subunits standalone because they don't do anything sensible. So this is what you put into a pod at Kubernetes. So this was the developer overview. So if you're, um, so the operations engineer overview. So somebody has to set up this cluster and operate it. Um, however, in Kubernetes, lets you separate the operations engineer from the developer. Because from the developer perspective, things get really simple. You have an application you want to deploy. So what do you do? You write a deployment file. A deployment file says, I want this image to run on three machines, and uh, every time I want this database to be in place with a volume attached which, which uh, persists my data. And then you go take this deployment definition, tell it to your uh, local Kubernetes client, who tells it to the server, and then uh, the service magically starts running. And you get back at which address you can reach it, or if you have defined it, it automatically allocates a load balancer from your cloud service provider and makes it available to the internet. So um, I've already explained what pods are. You also have to worry about pods, pods as a developer, but this is a very nice little abstraction of a kind of virtual machine where there are multiple containers running. 
You also have replica sets, so in case you want to have more pods or uh, want to have a pod that restarts itself when the node dies or whatever happens, um, or the program crashes, could sometimes happen, then you define some replica sets to keep the pods running happily. And finally, to make uh, the services these pods expose reachable, you define services which are a separate entity and they don't die, they're persistent, and they're always reachable via the same virtual IP. And then they, this virtual IP gets routed to the right pods which are currently offering the service. There's a whole lot of stuff which can also be done with Kubernetes, um, which I'm not going to mention now. Uh, they can do rolling updates, you can have volumes with persistent data, you can have liveness and readiness checks, which are different things. You can uh, feel like the 1960s and do batch jobs where you send jobs to the cluster to process. So all of this is supported by Kubernetes and it makes for a very um, pleasant environment to develop software for. Of course, also in this space, in this space of tooling, there are alternatives. Um, the Two, two of the big ones are Mesos, Apache Mesos, which comes from the big uh, operating data centers corner. So in case you have a very, um, they're used for legacy systems, for older systems, and they have a bit of a steep learning curve because when you start using Apache Mesos, you probably really need it. So you don't really want to run this on your laptop for playing around with it because it's a lot of uh, management overhead. Um, and then there, from the other corner, there is, in the other corner, there is Docker Swarm. Um, as I've mentioned, Docker has been developing and reorienting itself uh, several times in the last years. Docker Swarm is essentially um, a step in the direction of having a Docker server, a Docker daemon, uh, spanning multiple machines and being able to have containers on multiple machines. Um, given the bug incidents record of Docker, this, uh, the uptake has been, I think, um, it's, it's quite useful for testing, but I think the production uptake hasn't been that great. And, uh, right, so I hope I gave you a quick overview what Kubernetes is and, and why it might be useful to use in a containerized environment. Now, I'm going to do, uh, go to the final, um, final part of my talk and uh, talk about Jenkins, combining Jenkins and Kubernetes in the cloud uh, with Docker and everything together. Um, this is kind of a high-tech approach to continuous integration, I'm, I'm aware. So let's maybe recapitu recapitulate why we are actually doing this. So we started with a single Jenkins in the basement, running the tests every time someone pushes. Um, then we went to container orchestration. We went uh, into um, putting your tests in containers and running them, several of them at the same time to speed up your feedback time. Um, and at this point, if you have already done this, this is great. But if you haven't actually done this, uh, let me tell you, it's it sounds really easy, but there are a lot of little things that you have to worry about managing when you run containers in a CI, CI containers because you keep rebuilding them and starting them and they keep crashing and um, you have to clean up after them. You have to do a lot of things uh, to keep them happy, to wire them up manually, to make sure the right versions are selected every time. So there is a lot of management which you have to do when you do containerization of tests by hand. Um, and if you skip this step, if you skip the manual management of the containers and go straight to a system like Kubernetes, you can actually save time and effort. Because at that point you have a lot of management tools already there uh, which take stuff off your hands which you would have to you write bash scripts for or uh, groovy scripts or what what have you. So this is actually um, an advantage to using more tools because they're actually helping you do stuff faster. Um, the second thing is that 
in contrast to having a lot of hardware on site, uh, cloud hardware can be rented by the hour or by the minute. And given that you're actually using the CI most of the time during the work hours, this is actually a great advantage. Because you're not actually forced to buy the server for 24 seven hours, you can just buy it for the working hours during the week. And uh, finally, maybe you're already interested in giving your teams, if your teams run services and do operations as well in the context of DevOps, maybe you're already thinking about doing stuff like Kubernetes for production. And getting experience doing Kubernetes for CI is a great way to start to get experience to operate a Kubernetes cluster from the operation side and to use a Kubernetes soft cluster from the software side to gain experience with that. So let's get into the details. Now we're going to set up a Kubernetes cluster on Amazon Web Services. We, why Amazon Web Services? You could use Azure as well or a Google Compute Engine. Um, in our case, it's because we already using Amazon Web Services for a project at TNG. We have a Playground account at Amazon Web Services, so every TNG person can just go there and do stuff. For AWS, you need um, some helper tools, a helper tool called COPS. Where this is kind of the easiest thing to do, which actually does the request to set up virtual machines for a cluster and can do cluster management in AWS. The second helper tool I will use is Helm. Helm is an application package manager. So I've mentioned the deployment, the services, the pods and replication sets. And Helm allows you to essentially specify a little package with a service or more services, some pods and some uh, things and parameterize it and give it to um, people so they can reuse this set of services in their cluster. So first step, download these tools. They're all like static binaries. You can just download them and execute them. Uh, you create a subdomain because Kubernetes is very opinionated about domain names. It requires you to have a proper real domain name that you operate your cluster under because um, otherwise things will get uh, a bit complicated and might not work. And um, so you actually need to have a domain, uh, maybe not your primary domain, but some other domain, they're cheap, and you can run your cluster under it. Uh, you also need a, for, um, for COPS, you need an S3 storage bucket so that they can store some configuration data. And then you just have your desktop machine with your credentials and you run create cluster and then you give it the DNS name that you registered. So um, this is our uh, not quite official uh, name for this. Is actually, this is actually the subdomain we use for our Playground account. And um, then uh, create cluster just creates the configuration, then you update cluster and then it starts requesting uh, machines. Uh, so you have to say yes because you're going to pay for this. Um, and then after some minutes you have a cluster and uh, you don't have to write this down. There is a playbook at GitHub which contains these exact steps. Uh, you can still write it down if you want, sorry. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to stop you. Um, but I've left out some parts of the URL here because it wouldn't fit on the screen otherwise. Um, this is how you install software in Kubernetes. It's just you create a distribution, you init uh, the Helm tool, which ins also installs some software on your cluster, and then you install uh, the Jenkins package in the version 0 0.63. That's it. Now you have a Jenkins in the cloud. So this slide is not to show you how it's, no, not to make a kind of definite statement how it's done, but to, it's just to show you how easy it is to get a certain state. Um, you log in with credentials, which are get spit out during the previous step. You create an, a job. And in my case, we created a job that is actually with one of these cool Jenkins plugins, scanning a GitHub organization, given some credentials to get around GitHub's uh, uh, rate limiting, which is really, really uh, harsh if you're not logged in. Um, 
and you just say, I want to scan the organization, Cloud DCI. What does happen then? It goes there to GitHub, looks at all the repositories, and looks for Jenkins files. So Jenkins files is like Docker files, it's kind of become a popular concept, is a file where there are instructions to execute. In this case, because Jenkins is a continuous integration tool, the Jenkins file contains instructions, usually contains instructions how to run the tests. So there are automated instructions how to run the tests. They can differ between branches. So you can make a new branch where you install new tests or do something completely different, and it runs in a different, uh, different, uh, different project. So this is actually a, a minute later. I did take this screenshot where there are already two, um, two branches, two projects, two jobs uh, for each branch. One job for each branch has been cr automatically created and run, and we, the tests are green. So that's cool. How does this Jenkins file actually look? So this is an example of um, the synergy of the Jenkins Kubernetes plugin and running this thing actually on the cluster. So what you can do here is a very powerful thing, is with this statement, pod template, label Python pod containers and a list of container definitions, you start, when this pipeline is executed, you start a new pod on the Kubernetes cluster. This new pod then starts up, starts the containers, and then executes the, um, and then Jenkins uses this node directive to connect to this um, Jenkins slave and do its computation inside some of the, and passes commands inside some other container. For example, here, just into a Python container, which contains a Python executable. Um, there are a lot of possibilities that you can do using this, just this method. Um, and it's uh, a quite powerful approach to also keep your tests set up and in infrastructure as code so you can actually see changes, revert changes, diff changes, and merge changes together. Um, this is one possible approach to testing. You take the Kubernetes plugin for each test run, you create a pod, and then you run the tests inside the pod. Maybe you can hit more than one pod. You can nest these things and just uh, do many things and crazy things, lots, hundreds, around hundreds of pods, and um, parallelize your tests to your heart's content. Um, what you can also do if you're coming from a state where you already have a distributed container setup is that you can wire up your Docker control socket inside the container and use a Docker client and all your old automation scripts to control the outer Docker server. This is a bit of a Matroshka situation because you're running containers inside containers. Um, not, to, not to mix up with Docker and Docker, which is an entirely different beast altogether. Um, this is another approach which uh, might be useful if you're coming from a state where you already have doc uh, container automation. And finally, what you can also do, there is a little um, checkbox in the Jenkins UI which says set up kubectl, set up the Kubernetes control command line tool, and then you can just start into, in your job, write uh, Kubernetes co control com commands. So you can just take your current state of the software and deploy it into your Kubernetes cluster. And then you can start another port which just runs automated tests against this deployed system because you can do service discovery with Kubernetes. Um, you can also do this as a test approach, maybe for a complete integration test of the whole system. This is not all you can do with this setup. Um, we've heard that we can define pipelines in a Jenkins file, and for each branch there is one pipeline which gets executed to run the tests. However, the test pipelines are not the only jobs you want to have on a Jenkins. Often you have buttons like deploy or uh, downtime, set downtime, or other stuff that you want to have buttons for that must work in an emergency, and um, you really want a simple solution for this. So you take another Jenkins plugin, 
which is the job DSL, which allows you to just define jobs um, using virtually the same language as in the Jenkins file. And there, um, you have, uh, you can put this into a Groovy file and take construct a C job, which just takes this Groovy file and executes it on the Jenkins server. It creates all these jobs. It's, depending on your configuration, it also deletes old jobs and uh, updates the already existing jobs. So this is a good way to keep your infrastructure and your operations as code as much as possible because otherwise people are going to edit the configuration in the user interface and maybe change the script and so on. And uh, maybe if your Jenkins machine dies for some reason, this change is lost and suddenly your deployment doesn't work anymore, which is not a good thing. So we, um, I would actually suggest um, not actually doing this as a C job, but running this every time you run your master pipeline. So you have a blessed pipeline, and every time you run that, all the jobs get defined. So then you have no misunderstandings with your colleagues what should be the definitive state of the Jenkins. So, right, so what other cool things can we do? Obviously, one of the coolest things we can do is scaling because suddenly you're not limited by your rack space or your cooling power in your server room. You can buy hundreds of machines just for an hour or, or, or minutes. So um, I've calculated the number of, so the working days in Munich is 247. If you count with people leaving, arriving and leaving at different times with 10 hours per day. So that's only 28% of the year. So instantly your costs have been slashed to 28% of the costs before that. Obviously there's some markup because cloud machines aren't actually that cheap. Um, however, that is, comes out to about $100 to $150 per year per virtual CPU. That's not, that's a fair price, I would say. And if you're worried about costs and have some trainee time to spare, you can also set up a system where you use additional spot instances, which are often just a tenth of the price at the cost that they can disappear at any time, which shouldn't be a problem in CI, right? Because you have to rerun jobs sometimes anyway. Right, so that's the possibilities that you have with a cloud ECI setup. So let me just wrap up the talk. Um, what did I tell you? I told you fast test infrastructure is important because you want to have the cycle time of developers, the feedback time, until you get comprehensive feedback is as short as possible. Um, in case you're limited by latency and stuff and have resource conflicts, you can paralyze using containers. And finally, if you combine Jenkins and Kubernetes in the cloud, you can do um, a fast and cost-effective setup, which uh, with self-service and maybe additional beneficial effects for many teams. And if in case you're interested and haven't had and didn't uh, take notes during the talk, there is a playbook at github.com cloudy-ci AWS Kubernetes Jenkins, which walks you through the steps to get to this point. There are some things which are, should be added for a production setup, like uh, HTTPS, which I left out of the playbook because it's you can see the main effects there, but there are lots of guides on the internet how to set that up. Looking forward, obviously uh, this is a ploy to uh, spread Kubernetes around the world, so one of the things that they can do when you have a Kubernetes cluster is also run your production systems from it. There are features like namespaces and, and uh, role-based access control that can help separate the developers who should deploy from the developers who shouldn't be able to deploy. Right, that's it. Thanks for listening. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, I think we would have uh, time for a few questions.
so the question is how do we get from uh, this layers and layers of images to an RPM that we should chip production? Um, so since we're developing um, a hosted web application, uh, we're not actually doing this. We're actually deploying this in production um, as um, a pre-baked image. So, um, the techno so uh, what you in principle can do is you can bake an AMI image, which is an Amazon-specific image, with your software on it, which you have tested, and then you can test this image, and then you can just run a new machine on it. And that's an easy way to make sure that uh, everything, including the system and all of the dependencies, have exactly the same version that you tested. Because version upgrades can be, can be a thing uh, <coughs> with problems, associated with problems. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Terraform myself, so. Uh, <laughs> um, obviously, if you have, um, th that probably the, the performance regressions with Docker is, depends very much on your, on your load. I mean, uh, it could be that the virtual networking layer wasn't performant enough. So uh, this is why it's pluggable in, uh, in Kubernetes. You can do, use different virtual. I think the latest implementation actually reroutes the virtual IPs by using IP tables rules, which should be very fast. Um, Docker actually has, if you, depending on the configuration, has a software bridge, so it routes through user space, which should, is probably a bad thing for performance. Um, and again, if you, I mean, if you're familiar with Terraform and with setting up your own uh, tooling and stuff, this is already very, also very useful. Yeah, back there. Well, honestly, I would have to ask, uh, pass the question further to Patrick, maybe, um, <laughs> because my other colleague is not here, and... Um, uh, So, um, uh, again? <laughs> Yeah, so this was a project uh, on the tech days, so um, this wasn't uh, a former, this wasn't a formal uh, order from the customer, more or less, that we want to go to the cloud. This is something we experienced with the delays on testing, um, slow testing. So we ourselves took the initiative and evaluated technologies to actually speed up this process. And we have the kind, of, the system we use is kind of a bit complicated, so we have about five databases which 
interact, so uh, you have to do a bit wrangling for containers. Yeah. Mm. Well, there's a lot of flux in the in the system already, so this is definitely something for the early adopted early adopter type uh, person. So things will probably break in some way at some point. Um, however, you have you usually have a, a set of steps which you can take to regain control, and you also might not want to uh, do all version upgrades immediately without thinking. So you might want to keep old versions or the, or the versions you use around, um, especially if you don't expose it to the internet uh, without a firewall, then you might want to um, kind of keep running on one version until you make a little bit of a test effort to validate the next version and then switch over. That should save you from most of these things where you, where you come in in the morning and everything's broken because of some automatic update. Yes? Unfortunately not, because, um, yeah, unfortunately we don't have these numbers yet, because, um, uh, as I said, this is a research topic, more or less, at TNG, and we're suggesting it to the customer, and uh, it, um, it's looking good, so we're probably going to implement it. Okay, so, uh, oh, are there more questions? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So this is a feature that Jenkins can usually do quite well. There are several plugins that, that you, um, given that, I mean, your test runner usually takes, or can take a list of tests. So you can, some test runners even have the feature to split up the tests in a very deterministic manner. So for example, PyTest, can, you can say, uh, make four chunks of tests and run the first chunk, and this is repeatable so that if you tell four instances of PyTest, which know nothing about each other, to do the same thing, but with the first, second, third, and fourth chunk, they go and run the, like a fourth of the tests each. So um, this is one way we use it. So uh, I'm sure there exists lots of tool, lots of Jenkins plugins for this in the Java world as well, because Jenkins itself is also written in Java. So. Um, uh, this, this is a Jenkins problem. This is a problem that can be solved by the application of Jenkins. Well, unit tests usually run pretty quickly, but integration tests and um, some people um, run Selenium tests where you actually have a virtual browser um, or a real browser accessing a real system and clicking on stuff and waiting for animations to end and stuff, this is really slow. So uh, this is some of the examples where you have really long tests. So you said this being a research project at TNG and this is now in a prototype state, do you expect or plan to uh, make this, besides Jenkins, your go-to way of doing testing? Oh no, this is, I mean, um, if you have a small project or a project where unit tests or integration tests around a small set of tools is sufficient, where these run very fast, it wouldn't make sense to scale out beyond, you could just get a fast machine and run it, right? Or a fast virtual machine and run it. Obviously, this is a solution for, 
if you have a team of like 15, 16 people or like teams of 80 or a, a set of a group of teams of 80 people and they together want to use something like this, this would be for a large project that does integration tests which run for a long time, then this is uh, worth the effort. But I guess as long as you're small and your tests run fast, you're fine. I mean, at the lowest case, uh, when your tests run in a few minutes, then you should actually, I actually do discourage you not to do, the, uh, to do this because obviously then your tests are fine like, like just like running on a developer machine before you push, right? Okay, uh, so thank you Johannes for these uh, fascinating insights. Thank all of you for the lively debate. Thank you.